Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Libraries, he wrote, will soon become redundant, overtaken by the rapid march of technology. But the writer Will Self is now part of his own literary legacy, which is being preserved in the British Library for all posterity. He's one of several writers invited to curate their own archive, with everything from sketches and drafts for novels to letters from family and fellow authors. I went to the British Library to find out more. The best book's the next one. You know, like anybody else, I'm kind of looking to the future rather than the past. I mean, a, you know, posterity is a bit of a dirty word, I think, for any working creative artist. Will Self may look to the future, but all his words, past, present, and those still to be beaten out on his trusty typewriter, are to be preserved for that so-called dirty word, posterity. At 55, his work and the things which inspired it are being archived by the British Library. And that's, you know, where it's all going to be. Sharing a space with Shakespeare, Austin and Wolfe, among many others. There's an obvious advantage to archiving the work of someone who's still alive. In Self's case, helping to explain some of the hundreds and hundreds of post-it notes he's collected over the years. Um, so you can see I tend to... Do you like quite a post-it note as well? I like a post-it note. I used to work in an office which... and I'd put these post-it notes up on the wall. As I'm working on a book, they come down off the walls and go into these notebooks, which are categorised. So you create order out of the odd <laughs> post-it note going up? Well, I mean, I mean, you, you wanted, Jackie, to complete that phrase as order out of <laughs> chaos. I was stupid. I mean, uh, arguably... <laughs> Arguably, because some critics might say I create chaos out of chaos. Making order out of the archive isn't an easy task either, with 11 novels and a huge collection of essays, articles and even cartoons to his name. There's an enormous amount of background material. What do you think it tells people, either about you or about the work itself? Well, I think if you're a literary critic or a literary biographer, then these kinds of resources, you know, where you've got the, the actual typescripts of books, you've got the notes that were behind them. Uh, yeah, I think it gives you a sense of a rounded picture of the kind of milieu out of which these works came. What would be the thing you would hope people would take away from it if people come and look at... Oh, I hope nobody ever looks at it at all. <laughs> The archive also includes private letters, postcards and photographs, family documents and notes. Self says he was happy for it to be warts and all. I've been in the public eye for a very, very long time, so I'm used to that idea that, there's, you know, that I'm more on show, perhaps, than, than some other people. In a way, people's social media existence and their relationship with the web now is like creating an ongoing personal archive all the time. So, in a sense, it's not that different to people who are watching this and are kind of posting tweets and chucking stuff into the cloud. The very notion of archiving a body of work has perhaps taken on new significance in a digital world. Will Self acknowledges that writing has changed with the advent of the Internet. Ever the contrarian, as technology raced ahead, in 2004 he decided to go backwards, starting to work on a typewriter again. Working on a uh, wireless-enabled computer is, is actually inimical to, to, to writing novels. But why? Well, you're typing along, right? And, you know, to be a serious writer, and, and if you view prose as poetry, as I do, you think in words. And if you're writing and you're thinking, oh, you've got a character in a Morris Traveller, and you think, oh, I'd better have a look at a Morris Traveller. Suddenly you're looking at a Morris Traveller on the screen. Then you're describing the Morris Traveller. You're not thinking in words. It's not the same phenomenon. And of course, the distraction of it is also phenomenal. You might buy a pair of oven gloves or decide to see what some unfeasible sexual position looks like. I know a lot of people out there do that. Not speaking uh, personally. No, obviously. absolutely not. 
And what of the much talked about death of the novel, and by extension, the end of the novelist? In, in the late 80s, novelists were gods. We had groupies. You know, it's, it's, it already has changed. Nobody feels any shame about not reading contemporary writers of significance at all, or even the greats. We've moved into a different culture. I don't think the novels are going to die, but it's definitely going to become a secondary um, mode. Why then do you continue to write in this form on the typewriter with a view to creating a book? It's a form I love. I love the novel form. I've trained quite hard to write them. You know, the fact that they're not quite as en vogue as they used to be is kind of not the point. Well, Will Self joins me now, and also here is the writer Paris Lees, whose work is archived at the Bishopsgate Institute. Will Self, I mean, does archiving become more or less relevant in a digital age? Well, I suppose in some sense you could look upon the paper archives that are being built now as analogous to the last of the pharaoh's tombs before the end of the Egyptian civilization. So in that sense, they may have great significance because as, as an example of the end of this particular form of knowledge technology. However, I simply do not think that the kind of paper-based literary criticism, literary biography that grew up in the 20th century and became a huge industry in a way and grafted in our university system is going to continue into the period of digitization. I mean, perhaps these you've been, your work has been archived. What do you think is the point of that? Well, I think it's important to note that, that the published work has been archived. So actually, some of the pieces I think have been most powerful and have, have made the biggest impact are actually online. So I think that the Bishopsgate Institute are thinking of, of doing an online uh, archive as well. So I, I do think that we're at an interesting point in history. I collect everything. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder, and I think it is important to have that stuff. But um, where do you leave it? You know, are we going to start archiving tweets of notable people? Um, you know, their whole timeline. And, and, and I don't think anyone really knows where that leaves us. So it's been part of this digital revolution where, you know, uh, who, who knows? And do you agree with Will's point that in a way we're all archived because of our we're living online now to an extent but i think that for example i wrote for one website and then they updated their website and all the pieces were lost so i think that we can get a bit complacent and just assume that if you go back to somewhere that the the, the piece that you wrote or that you like of somebody else's it, it will always be there and you can't rely on that actually so i think that these paper archives are still important but it's how they're implemented and why does it matter that we keep this stuff, that it's still there, that we can access it? Well, I think traditionally, why, madam, why, why these archives have built up, and, you know, I, I mean, a bit bizarre to relate, I was first approached to sell my archive 20 years ago, so you know, it was really kind of... They were virtually tearing the paper off the typewriter before I could finish it. And I think it's because a complex uh, uh, idea had grown up that you could learn a lot about the way a writer developed a piece by looking at different versions, looking at the flanking material, the notes, all of that stuff. Uh, and, and that in itself became a kind of industry. But I don't think that's going to persist. But, but does it teach us anything about the world at large, individuals, writers, and how they might write? But what about the, the world and our history, individual archives? Does well, that... You'd like to think so, wouldn't you? But, I mean, I'm, I'm just really despairing at the moment and feeling quite depressed about the state of the world. And the 20th century was one of the most documented mm. uh, periods of history. And, you know, the, the Second World War, we, we've got all of the information about that. And yet we seem to be making the same mistakes. So I'd, I'd love to think that people would learn from history. But, uh, you know... No one, no one seems to be bothered. You know, they've, they've got the facts in front of them and, and we just seem to be marching onwards and, and it's really depressing. But is it because there's too much information and actually we self-select, we select what we want yes. to read, what we want to... There's a vast amount of information. There's more than anybody can get hold of. Bear in mind, before the web, you would have to go to a library really to get books that are not that uncommon. You'd have to engage physically. You know, the process of looking as it were at analogue material was an analogue process that involved your moving towards it. So it is a very different culture. And I'm afraid I slightly disagree with Paris. I mean, it is all out there. I mean, it's vastly out there. I mean, as, a, as a, somebody who works as a university teacher, as a writer, I can get just about anything I need with the terminal very quickly. I'm really sorry we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> Will Self-Pasley, thank you so much. I've been